All right, morning coaches. Welcome to today's uh, e-workshop, Sleep Science for Sports Coaches. We'll be starting in real soon. All right, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping matters. We have muted all of our mic. However, we strongly encourage you to post your questions, comments, uh, input in the Zoom chat box. And by the way, we are having some technical difficulties broadcasting it on Facebook, but nevertheless, uh, we will still carry on with the e-workshop. Okay, just a couple of uh, quick background on this uh, e-workshop. So this e-workshop will be delivered by Dr. Richard Swinborn, who is currently a head nutritionist and sleep scientist with Singapore Sport Institute. Today, he'll be talking about the science behind sleep. Why is it so important? And as coaches, how can you work together with your athletes to devise sleep strategies that can help improve their athletic performance? So without further ado, uh, Rico, please. Great, thanks, man. Welcome, everybody. Uh, right, let's see if we can share some screens here. <clears throat> All right, I hope you can see that okay. All right. Um, well, yeah, welcome along. It's, um, it's a nice time to talk about sleep. It's bang on 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, where our circadian rhythm is um, is peaking and our powers of concentration are peaking. We are most alert um, in the day at 10 a.m. in the morning. So uh, for once, I've drawn a good time. Um, usually I get uh, sunk with the after lunch presentation slot. Um, and that happened to me yesterday, actually, presenting to, uh, um, to the Life Sciences Institute conference in the Philippines. It was running out of the Philippines. And I had to go last out of three speakers and the first two speakers were medical doctors and, um, you know, they, uh, they talked a lot and then got, got to mine and it was about three o'clock and, you know, I'm pretty sure I lost a few people <laughs> having a bit of a nap. Um, but, you know, that's okay. If you do feel sleepy, um, I actually don't mind if you have a nap you close your eyes and, and not off. Um, such is the power of sleep. It's just so good for you. We know that nappers live uh, longer than non-nappers, so it's a very healthy habit. Um, uh, that said, and this is a great takeaway tip for you and a tool to put in your toolbox and a question to ask your athletes or even to ask yourself because, you know, you're high-performance personnel as well and your performance is very important and influential on your athletes. Um, if you could go back to bed before lunchtime and, and fall asleep, that is, um, is predictive and suggestive that... Uh, your sleep last night was not good enough. Um, either it was uh, poor quality, you woke up a lot, or you just didn't get enough total sleep. Um, so, uh, so a very easy little litmus test right off the bat. Um, just tuck that one away. Uh, quite nice to ask. Um, but uh, yeah, today Sleep 101, I guess um, some of you might have heard from me before. I've done a few of these with Coach SG in the past. And I try and do a couple a year um, and uh, I'll put some new stuff in this presentation. So if you have heard from me before, I'm sure there'll be something new in there. And, and even if you just take away one little thing new, then, you know, our time together has been well spent. And indeed, um, if, uh, if all it does is refresh you about the importance of sleep, then that's really good too. So very much a, a sleep science um, for athletes and coaches 101 presentation. Um, you know, why sleep is important and, and just some little tips on how to improve that and how, how to help your athletes improve that. But it's very, um, it's a very coach centric presentation, obviously, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to get really um, unique adaptations out of your athletes. Like, you know, you want them to get fitter, faster, stronger, more powerful, uh, and indeed more skilled as well. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of learning, there's a lot of motor learning, uh, neural um, adaptation, muscular adaptation, and actually um, it all happens uh, when your head's on the pillow and when your athlete's head's on the pillow. So, you know, <clears throat> if you don't want to sabotage or compromise your program or you want to really, um, you know, enhance the adaptations uh, and changes that you're getting out of your athletes, then, um, you know, it's during sleep um, that that happens. So, um, so, yeah, it's all good stuff. All right, let's just uh, work through this. 
It's me again. Practice, right? Okay, so um, here's a little uh, a little picture from a few years ago, actually, um, at the Hurricanes uh, Super Rugby team, uh, the pro rugby team in New Zealand, where I was really lucky to um, to firstly anchor my PhD uh, around this team. Um, I started my PhD back in 2011, so I think I took my studies into this environment around 2013. Uh, and work with them. So that was the 13, 14 season and then work with them through to the 15, 16 season um, when I moved to Singapore. Uh, of the three years that I worked with them, uh, we made the, the finals twice and we won it um, in 2016. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it'd be lovely to say that it, it's because of what these guys are doing right here now, right, uh, as you see on the screen, um, having a snooze and and most certainly that that was influential and we saw some tremendous benefits and changes within the athletes um, but of course you know it's uh, there's no I in team and, and we had some wonderful protocols and, and, and brilliant coaches and a, an outstanding strength and conditioning team um, brilliant physios um, and and you know the players are very talented um, great work ethic as well but at a sleep science level, they really bought into it because it was quite new back then and they were really interested in it. Um, they didn't know anything about it and it really captured their imagination. And I think if you start talking about sleep and the power of sleep with your athletes, I think you get the same reaction actually. Um, as, as old as sleep is, um, humans have been sleeping for millions of years. Um, athletes ironically and coaches ironically are just only now starting to wake up to the fact that it can be really performance enhancing. So, um, so in terms of um, in terms of athlete examples, um, I was in the conference yesterday, and LeBron James came up because the Lakers um, just uh, just took out the NBA, didn't they? And uh, and he was sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber or something, and and doing something strange. But um, you know, there's there's lots of examples of elite athletes now in the world. Um, chasing gains and, and chasing a performance enhancing edge through sleep and through working with people like me, um, you know, just getting the basics, the foundations of sleep quality and quantity right. Um, actually, it's not rocket science. It's it's quite kind of simple unless there's um, a pathology at play and there's like a sleeping disorder or something. Um, actually, it's all very controllable and you guys as coaches could, could definitely carry this conversation with your athletes. I, I would love you to actually. Um, because there's not enough of me to, to kind of go around. So I need you to spread the good word. But there's some, some great examples within Premiership football. Um, Rafael Nadal, eight to 10 hours, um, just cleaned up uh, Djokovic, didn't he, the other day uh, in the Grand Slam. Um, you know, clay court specialist and, um, you know, sleep, uh, plays on a, on a good night's sleep. Um, Roger Federer as well actually sleeps more 10 to 12 hours. Um, and uh, and a big nap there in the afternoon too. LeBron James also a big sleeper. Usain Bolt regularly napped for breaking world records in the afternoon. Uh, that was part of his habit and routine. And that's the secret really is to make it um, habit and routine. If if athletes are not routinely nappers, then just throwing a one-off nap into the equation actually makes them worse. Um, they'd be better off to stay awake. But if they can practice napping, um, they can certainly put that into their performance pathway. Um, and their, their competition preparation. So, um, in terms of uh, in terms of sleep, we have a lot a lot to thank um, this 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 handsome young man here, uh, Homo erectus, who worked, walked on Earth around two million years ago. And it was um, at around that point that human sleep evolved um, profoundly because Homo erectus was the first primate to climb down out of the trees and actually sleep on the ground. Uh, and just simply by sleeping on the ground, he managed to shrink a required sleep time from 15 hours, um, because that's how much monkeys and primates sleep, around 15 to 17 hours a night. He managed to condense our sleep window down to eight hours and he managed to double the amount of REM or dream sleep that we can obtain um, by, uh, by 100%. So it went from 12% of total sleep to 25%. And 
And the reason he did that is because he could completely relax. So um, this, is, um, this is a picture of a monkey having a snooze in a tree and you can see with his little hand there, he's hanging on to the branch really tightly, right? But when we dream, we become completely paralyzed. We, re we release our brain releases a, a, a neural blocker which um, paralyzes every single muscle in your body except for your eyes. That's why it's called rapid eye movement sleep and your diaphragm so you can keep breathing. But other than that, we're completely paralyzed. And of course, we do that because it protects us from, um, from harm. It protects us from acting out our dreams, right? Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be in the monkey's best interest to completely go limp and relax and let go of the branch with a beautiful, long, deep sleep and a beautiful, long dream because he would quite literally fall out of the gene pool overnight, wouldn't he? He'd fall straight out of the tree and, and die. So, um, so that's why monkeys don't sleep very well. They can't afford to completely relax. So they have a very poor quality sleep. Whereas Homo erectus was able to lie down on the ground and completely relax and, and, and really nourish his brain with this beautiful, long, deep dream sleep. Um, if he relaxed, he couldn't fall any further. So something quite, um, quite, simple uh, but quite interesting and fascinating and really hugely influential on the human brain and its evolution and development um, and you know we we have a lot to thank homo erectus for that's for sure and so i just wanted to start a little bit of, a little bit of chat around rem and dream sleep because you know we all we all we all dream every night actually um it's um it's uh, it's a really important part of um, of dreaming and, and of, of sleep and human sleep and my phone's uh, very distracting um, uh, and and it plays a really important role in emotional intelligence and um, and building our cognitive intelligence um, and there's a lot of creativity that is stemmed from um, from dreaming. Um, the Beatles actually, Paul McCartney, I don't know if you remember the song uh, yesterday, but he actually dreamt that lyric and that tune in his sleep. Um, and there's some other examples as well of, of artists um, dreaming about songs and then waking up uh, and writing it down or just, or just sitting down at the piano. Um, and then, you know, it just all rolls out. Um, the periodic table was actually also invented during dreams as well. So. Um, we do some, some extraordinarily comp complex problem solving uh, during sleep and during dreams. And indeed, during sleep, some parts of our brain are 30% more active, actually, than when we are awake. So once upon a time, people used to think that, um, you know, sleep was a waste of time. Like, you know, we were just kind of, you know, unconscious doing nothing. But, but actually, um, we could potentially be more active during sleep than when we're awake. And it's certainly when all the magic happens. So uh, nice to share that with you today and, and just build that respect for sleep and the role of it and the role of dreams. Of course, we have sleep cycles and sleep stages. And a lot of people get really curious about this. Uh, they wonder, you know, what the different, different stages of sleep do. Um, and so I thought I would just quickly take you through that if you haven't, um, if you haven't, read about that before or, or listen to that it's quite interesting so if you this is a um a, a sleep map or a, a hypnogram so this really describes like typical sleep stages and sleep patterns this is based off a seven hour night so you can see on the left hand side there at the top um you know the subject is awake and falls asleep within about five minutes that's normal uh five to fifteen minutes is normal um, if somebody falls asleep in less than five minutes, it's a sign that they are chronically tired or significantly sleepy um, and, and perhaps a little too sleepy or a little too tired, right? Um, and then what happens is that we turn into a bit of a whale and we go for a dive. Uh, and we, we just drop down through these different stages of, of sleep and, and levels of unconsciousness, if you like. So uh, non-REM one and two, that's what we call light sleep. Uh, and we spend around about um, we spend around about five minutes in, in stage one, and then we whip straight through into stage two sleep. Um, the human brain doesn't like lingering in doorways, so we transition from sleep stages uh, very quickly. And we probably spend about uh, about twenty to thirty minutes um, in, in stage one and two, 
uh, before we descend even deeper, uh, we're really turning the anesthetic up now. Um, if people, if you, if if you're a snorer or you know people that snore and you know they're really sucking the <laughs> sucking the flies in, right? Um, this is all happening in deep sleep, uh, stage three and four, and you can see uh, we spend around about um, about 40 minutes down in that space, and then we come back up and we resurface after about 90 minutes. We have a little dream. You can see that little red bar there, that first red bar. That's uh, non-REM sleep. Um, and then we usually wake up before or after that dream uh, and that uh, resetting process and then we drop back down again through the sleep stages. Um, and, uh, and the cycle repeats itself, okay, and then we go through another sleep, st uh, sleep cycle, another 90 minutes. Um, the next one, and the next one, the, the dream stage, the REM sleep is a little bit longer, okay, and you can see after the second dream, the person actually wakes up. Right, and then they and then they go into the next sleep cycle. If you're good with patterns, you'll see a couple of things happening here. One is that um, after the first couple of sleep cycles, deep sleep ceases. There's no more de deep sleep in the later half of the night, and it's in deep sleep that we physically regenerate, we physically repair. You know, if you have smashed your athlete and you know you've really uh, damaged their legs, okay, so it's during deep sleep that they'll be undertaking muscle protein synthesis repair, regeneration, you know, joints, bones grow, um, about 90% of bone growth occurs during deep sleep as well. All right, so that physical repair is prioritized by the body and, um, and its, second, um, its second priority is, is, is boosting the brain, uh, the brain battery, I suppose. Um, and, and that largely occurs uh, during light sleep and during dream sleep. And the other pattern you might see is that dream sleep gets longer and longer as the night goes on. And, and actually most of our dreaming occurs in the early hours of the morning and the last two hours of our sleep uh, between hour six and hour eight. Uh, and remember it's during dream sleep that we nourish our emotional and our psychological health. We keep our mood buoyant and positive. Um, and we also get very, very uh, creative in terms of um, problem solving uh, imagination, um, you know, vision, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, you might be sitting there thinking, gosh, I only got six hours sleep last night. What does that mean for my dream sleep? Uh, it means you didn't get very much, uh, which means, you know, there's, there's, um, there's increased vulnerability and, and risk around, around these aspects of, of, um, of our health that dream sleep nourishes and, and certainly that of your athletes. Um, and, you know, um, psychological health is being talked about a, a whole bunch at the moment because of COVID, because of, um, you know, uh, all the insecurities and unknowns that that throws up. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, poor, like examples of poor psychological health commonly in our athletes um, and also in our coaching group as well. So, um, you know, just thinking about that hour six to hour eight, aspect of your sleep, really, really important. Um, and you can see there too, light sleep, there's a ring around light sleep, um, which I think as a coach is a very interesting space for you because it's in here that athletes develop their motor skill learning. Uh, and again, the great majority of that occurs between hour six and hour eight. So if your athletes are sleeping five hours a night, um, you know, it's really profoundly impacting negatively their their ability to learn what you're teaching them um, as opposed to a more replete sleep uh, where their motor learning um, and their, their neural um, cognitive adaptations will be much much faster and we spend about half the night in light sleep actually so it's a really important sleep stage so so there we are so that's uh that sleep stage is just to dive a little deeper because people get really interested and curious in this um, so um, deep sleep, physical regeneration, this is when we release um, a whole bunch of growth hormone and that um, drives our muscle protein synthesis and, and for athletes to have some sort of protein food before bed is really important because that protein then becomes the building blocks of that, um, of that new muscle tissue and that repair. It's like dropping a whole lot of bricks at the, at the workplace. You know, if you want to build a wall overnight, you need some bricks to build with. So. Um, you know, just ensuring that your athletes are getting some good um, real food, whole food protein sources. Um, if they're eating late after training, then, you know, getting some chicken or fish or meat on the plate 
um, or you know dairy products. Um, a lot of athletes can actually tolerate dairy, no problem here. Um, for the odd athlete that struggles with lactose, there's even like lactose free milk options in the supermarket. Um, and we would certainly encourage that over the use of supplements, which can be rather misguided and, and rather risky in this day and age. And they should have proper advice around that before thinking about that. But, you know, that deep sleep is really important, um, you know, to fix the legs. I guess it's a very primal response. You need, you need, you need good, strong legs to run away from the um, saber tooth tiger, don't you? Um, maybe you don't need your brain quite so much to run a straight line. I don't know. Um, but, um, the physical regeneration happens first, and and from there, um, and from there, the brain regeneration. During deep sleep, there's some really good stuff that happens in the brain, though, and one of them is that we give it a wash. So you can see here a picture of of, um, of uh, cerebrospinal fluid coming up from the spine and actually working through these um, these channels in the brain, um, and the channels expand. And, and allow the cerebrospinal fluid to wash through the brain. And it washes away a toxin called beta amyloid. Um, imagine never brushing your teeth properly, right? What happens is that you get a buildup of plaque on your teeth and that's damaging, isn't it? And then you get, you know, you get um, dental decay and you need fillings and things. Same thing happens in the brain, but the decay actually causes um, Alzheimer's and dementia. And we know that there's, a, there's a, just a, a very, very, very clear relationship between not sleeping a lot and being at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and, you know, uh, we could even think about two world leaders who um, have left this world now, but um, Ronald Reagan, the US president, and um, Margaret Thatcher, the, the British prime minister, um, both big themselves up and, and talked up the game that, you know, they only needed four hours sleep a night and that's all they got. Um, and unfortunately, both of them developed Alzheimer's and both of them died young. Um, so, yep, science has, has proven now that there's a very clear link there. Yet another reason to really respect sleep and, and try and get as much sleep as you can because it, it very much is protective. Um, and then uh, also within deep sleep, Yes, we've got physical repair. Yes, we're washing the brain, um, but we're also doing some really cool stuff around memory. Um, I would suspect most of your athletes are students and they're trying to develop their academic game um, as quickly and, and as well as they are their sporting game. Um, and this is a really important one for them because, you know, the brain can only hold so much information, can't it? And we have this really interesting little part of our brain called the hippocampus. It it's kind of sits behind your eyes. Um, it's around about the size of your little finger, if you look at that, and you've kind of got two of them. So it just kind of sits there in the middle of your brain. And, you know, it like I call it the human USB stick, it's kind of the same shape and size, and, and it literally is. So this is where we store short-term information, particularly academic type facts and figures. Um, and, it, you know, like a USB stick, you know, two gigabytes, like once it's full, it's full, like you can't put any more in it. Uh, and it's actually the, the, the act of sleeping, which, um, which clears or, or resets the, the USB stick, empties out the data, shifts it into long-term storage. <clears throat> and then, of course, when your USB stick is empty again, you can refill it up with new information. So that's what's happening there um, during deep sleep. And this little, info, this little infographic kind of displays that a little bit better. So you can see um, during, during deep sleep, uh, it's sometimes called slow wave sleep. And that just relates to what we see um, on an on a EEG. So the waves are very long and slow and, and oscillating. If you imagine like, uh, like waves lapping on a beach, it's kind of like that. Um, versus when we're awake, brain waves are, are crazy and all over the show. Um, and they're also crazy and all over the show uh, during dreaming as well. Um, that's how animated our brain gets, same as when we're awake. But it's during this um, slow wave emission that we have these little sleep spindles, and you can see a little picture of that. It sounds like a machine gun, um, like an automatic weapon firing, like it's uh, like a big burst of activity. And that burst of electrical activity actually acts like a courier um, so, uh, you know, that's DHL carrying your newly acquired information um, from your hippocampus into your neocortex, which is up, you know, closer to the surface of your head. 
Um, and it's in there that it gets locked away in a storage facility in a, in a long-term um, bank, um, a safety deposit box, if you like. Um, in terms of practical application, um, they did an interesting study where they taught a bunch of young people a bunch of stuff academically, and then they let half of them um, have a nap. The other half didn't um, sleep. And then when they woke them up, they taught them a, a bunch of new information again and then tested them on their recall. And the nappers actually recalled 40% more of the new information than, than the group that had to stay awake all day. Uh, and of course, that's because the hippocampus, the USB stick, was, was allowed to empty out and transfer all that new information into the neocortex. Um, and then it could refill up with new information again. Whereas the people that stayed awake all day, the USB stick, the hippocampus got full it remained full and then they couldn't absorb new information so so a really nice little practical um takeaway particularly for um, for athletes that are academically engaged you know having a little nap after school before studying um, after evening training really really good idea and as a coach too i mean you the name of your game um is, is motor learning isn't it and and getting athletes to acquire um you know um new information and, and, and new skills through gross and fine motor skills. And, and they did a really interesting study actually where they taught people to play the piano. Um, and, and what they found was that, um, so this is the study, I've actually put the, the key sequence up there for you and you can actually practice this on your keyboard if you want. So what they asked the subjects to do was, um, was type out four, one, three, two, four four, one, three, two, four. And what they found actually when they replayed that was that um, they, couldn't they couldn't do it seamlessly. They had to chunk it up. So they'd kind of go four, one, and then there was a little break and then they'd go three, two, four, four, one, three, two, four. And, uh, you know, obviously it got smoother, but it was, it was never really super smooth. And they asked them to do it 12 times. And then half of them, they sent away um, again to have a sleep. Um, uh, the other half um, had to stay awake and when they when they woke the sleepers up they got them to repeat that sequence and what they found was that they like they got up out of bed and they sat down at the keyboard and this went four and three two four four and three two four and it was just seamless and automatic um and and you know really quite shocking and surprising that that they could do that um and and actually what they found was that they were 20 percent faster at that key sequence and they were 35% more accurate, which is incredible. They'd done no more practice. Um, well, they'd done no more practice while awake than the group that didn't sleep. Um, but of course, it was during sleep that they were practicing those skills, those fine motor skills all over again. And you can see when they scanned their brains, the top row is when they're awake learning the piano. The middle row is where they were asleep. Um, and, and the red is the, is the learning neurons um, that were activated in both states as opposed to the group at the bottom that had to stay awake. So you can see the group at the bottom, you know, there was, there was very little learning activity going on and taking place while they were awake versus the group that went to sleep. Their brains completely re-engaged with that lesson um, and they, they actually practiced that skill um, all over again while they were asleep. And of course, as a coach, you know that when you practice something, you get better at it. Um, so actually it's not practice makes perfect, it's practice with sleep that makes perfect. It's during sleep that, um, that everything's practiced all over again and, uh, you know, um, nerves, uh, nerves that, that fire together, wire together, right? So, um, it just creates a stronger neural link, uh, and better execution when, when the athlete wakes up again. Interestingly as well, um, the closer you, the closer you program a skill session with a sleep block, like the harder that wiring occurs. So as long as the athlete gets a good overnight sleep, like this wiring will occur um, overnight. But, you know, if, if an athlete has a compromised overnight sleep, maybe they're going through exams. Um, when we get back to travel, this is a really important consideration. Maybe like this, the sleep's going to be disrupted for a night or two. So you can actually think about where you drop your skill sessions into the day. Maybe you, you do the skill session, um, maybe maybe just before lunch, have lunch and then have a nap or, or after lunch um, and then send the athletes away to have a nap. 
a little bit later in the afternoon um, and then that, that skill session will become actually even more effective for you. Um, just to give a, um, a local example, um, I talked before about the hurricanes and my work with the hurricanes um, and you know what, what a profound influence that had on the athlete group uh, and what we did with the hurricanes was like basically my study was, was around get them to sleep more. We call it sleep extension. Um, and so, you know, if an athlete habitually sleeps seven hours, you know, try and get them to sleep, you know, eight and a half or nine. I usually challenge them to sleep 10, but that's generally impossible <clears throat> just for the way people live these days. Um, but, you know, if they're adding on an hour, hour and a half of sleep, um, up to two hours of sleep, you know, we see really incredible benefits to the brain and the body. So this was a question we asked um, late last year, what happens if we take um, a more brain first athlete, you know, not a rugby player, but, but a bowler, a 10 pin bowler. Um, I don't know if we have any bowling coaches in the audience today, but um, Singapore is incredibly talented at bowling um, and it requires, um, you know, really acute hand-eye coordination, um, you know, fine motor skills um, and a really smart brain to get this right. Um, and so we asked the question, what happens if we take bowlers and we get them to sleep more than normal? At the end of the day, will it make them a better bowler? Um, so I had a talented young man from, um, from Duke uh, in the US. Um, uh, his name is Clarence. Um, he's since gone on to graduate and uh, is now running, um, working within a, a really nice research program at, at NUS. So really nice outcome. They did a great job of this study. So we, we were asking the question, um, you know, does, does, um, does it influence, like, does an does a education program with athletes help them improve their sleep quantity and quality, their bowling performance? Um, and does it actually impact their physical stress levels as well? So this is kind of what we did um, in terms of a method. This just gives you a little bit, let's get that arranged, gives you a little bit of an idea. So we use the athletes as their own controls. Um, and so we just observed them for a week, uh, just under normal living conditions. Interestingly, a lot of the athletes were going through exams at the time and, and were not sleeping a lot, um, you know, five and six hours a night, um, but that's just real life in Singapore. And so I actually, I was quietly happy that that happened. Um, we gave them a briefing, we gave them a sleep watch, um, we gave them saliva um, collection kits because we were looking at um, cortisol stress levels in their saliva. And you can see the little drooling emoji there, that's where we collected the saliva. And the purple ball um, signifies game day. So we, we put them through uh, three games of bowling um, and then analyzed those results. And then um, we exited the control period and uh, entered the intervention phase. Um, and so at the start of the intervention phase, we gave them a sleep hygiene talk, not dissimilar um, to this and, and perhaps a little more um, a little more along the lines of what I'm going to teach you in January. I think it's January when, when we get back together again and we'll go through a little bit more stuff um, in and around sleep hygiene and, and sleep uh, improvement um, intervention measures and strategies. But basically we taught them why sleep's important and how to sleep a whole bunch better. Um, they went away and did it um, and uh, it was certainly very, very effective. Um, you can see here just the impact that, that a simple education talk had on their time in bed um, and also their total sleep time. Um, and so during the intervention, you can see a significant increase in both time in bed and total sleep time. So, you know, they really effectively extended their sleep um, on average uh, by, um, you know, close to an hour. And then on the other side there, you can see, um, we ran some questionnaires with the athletes uh, and the athlete um, sleep quality questionnaire um, was one that we used and it generates a global score for what's called a sleep difficulty score. And you can see the results there. So on the left under the control phase, this was just normal life, uneducated, untouched with the athletes. You can see half of them were having, um, you know, a mild degree of sleep difficulty um, um, and a small amount uh, having, you know, quite severe sleep problems um, that, you know, sh should really be addressed more deeply. Um, and then, you know, a big bunch actually having a, a moderate degree of, of difficulty. 
So in a young athlete population, it's actually kind of a scary picture, to be honest. And then after intervention, you can see, um, you know, how many more of the athletes had suddenly no issues, no problems, no sleep difficulty. Um, and even the ones with uh, mild and moderate really reduced and we had no one in the severe category. So, so a really nice outcome. And, and, and just from actually just talking to athletes about sleep, which was great. Okay, where the rubber hits the road for a coach is bowling performance, right? Or performance of any kind. Um, and so what you can see here, just to translate this and these statistics, um, is the effect size. So we ran um, magnitude-based stats or, or um, calculated some effect sizes. So effect size is basically what, what effect did sleep extension have bowling game and, and, um, and the bowling scores, right? And what we found for, um, for the strike percentage, the total pinfall, the average score per game, um, and the all sport, all spare percentage was, um, was a small magnitude of change. Um, now, small does not necessarily mean insignificant in sport, as you know, where people win and lose by the smallest of margins. If you think about the 2019 world champs, only two points separated a medal winner from a non-medalist in both the men's and women's singles, right? And so, um, you know, the average score per game under more sleep increased by seven points per athlete. So after sleep extension, each athlete on average um, scored seven points more than, than when they were sleeping less. Okay, so that's seven versus a two point differential um, at the 2019 World Champs. And then if we step down a run, um, even at the Sea Games last year in the Philippines, five points separated a podium finish and getting a medal with fourth place uh, in the men's singles. Um, again, you know, potentially a little more sleep going into that um, could, have, could have been the difference between bringing home a medal or not, which is really quite interesting. Um, and so, you know, in practical sense, should athletes or can athletes just be sleeping more 365 days of the year? The answer is probably not. You know, I've had this conversation many times with many people and at the end of the day, you know, life is tough and we've got to jam a lot into it and sometimes we just don't get enough sleep. Um, and, you know, like, okay, that's just reality. Where, where can we actually look at our program, at our athlete management, at our lifestyle and, and how, can we, how can we actually fit a little more sleep in at strategic times? So we call it sleep banking. Um, you can actually save your sleep up um, if you're going to go into, for example, um, a, a tournament, uh, a weekend tournament, a week-long tournament, um, an exam week, um, something quite stressful like a block of time. Maybe it's a really high-intensity, in, uh, high um, high-volume training block where sleep is likely going to be compromised and break down. What you can do is encourage the athlete to sleep a little bit more than normal for about a week before that competition or that tournament or that exam or that training block. And they can actually save that sleep up and take it into the performance block. Um, and they will likely perform, um, they will likely perform better um, day by day. And they'll also recover uh, much better afterwards as well and much more quickly. And one study found actually um, under such circumstances that um, people who slept a little bit more before a, a really grueling five-day kind of, it was like a hell week, really, a little bit like a Navy SEAL hell week, but they, they recovered after one night of recovery sleep versus the other, um, the control group that didn't sleep anymore before the hell week. Um, they, they had not returned to their, to the, to the pre hell week, um, performance variables after five nights of recovery sleep. So, so just banking up a little bit of sleep can help performance day by day and it helps recovery rates as well. So there you go. Um, someone's just sent me something. Sorry, I can't read and uh, I'll come back to that. I, I, um, I can't read and, uh, and talk at the same time. I'll, I'll come back to that point. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, where am I taking this picture? I don't want your athletes to look like this. I don't want you coaching monkeys, I suppose, at the end of the day. 
I want you coaching, um, you know, homo erectus. I want your athletes to be getting really good, deep, long, sound sleeps. Don't let them be the monkey up the tree, gripping the branch and, and holding on for dear life, surviving but not thriving, right? That's really uh, what it's all about. So um, I, I am sure you're hungry for a few little... Uh, recall your screen is frozen. Okay, uh, coaches, looks like the presenter has encountered some technical issues. So uh, please give him a couple of minutes to log back in. Thank you. Uh, Rico, you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yep. Yeah, sorry. Technical difficulty. There we are. I don't know. I was almost to the end, actually. Um, yeah, so uh, supporting children to sleep, we get really good at it really quickly. And what that is, um, is sleep hygiene. Um, you know, if you, if you can imagine... Um, you know, we give, uh, we give babies a feed and then we give them a drink of milk and we give them tryptophan to build melatonin with that. And then we give them a nice warm bath so they're getting some skin warming, which actually increases the, um, or, 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 or quickens the propensity to fall asleep. Um, it, it decreases uh, sleep latency. And then, you know, we pull the blinds. We don't put a phone in front of their face generally. Um, we sing them a nice song or read them a story. Um, you know, we say goodnight to the giraffe and the hippopotamus all at the same time. Um, in the same order. Um, and, you know, there's just a really nice comforting rhythm to the routine. And eventually, you know, the baby will fall asleep before it even gets to the end of it, um, such as the, um, as, uh, as the comfort, I suppose, of, of being in a routine. You know it works and, and the brain just loves routine. So um, nice analogy to use with your athletes is that of a campsite. Uh, you know, if you or your athletes can turn your house, your apartment into a campsite, and by that, I mean just simply turn off the overhead lights and let it go dim when the sun goes down is when we're meant to start making melatonin, right? Um, but people keep artificial light, blue light saturation, um, and it's, you know, they keep it shining in their eyes and it suppresses our ability to make melatonin. And, it's, and, and that's one of the reasons why people take so long to fall asleep, can't sleep until after midnight, etc. cetera. Um, and, it, and it has a really profound effect and, and could put people to sleep potentially two hours earlier if they just drop all the lights and, and put a lamp on or something. Um, in studies, um, you know, they've put people in the Grand Canyon. They've observed hunter-gatherer tribes. And this is what happens when the sun goes down, the ambient light gets a lot dimmer and people um, get sleepy much earlier. Um, of course, the other thing that happens is it gets a little bit cooler when the sun goes down. Um, and they actually think with hunter-gatherer tribes in the Amazon, are watching them that they're more sensitive to temperature than they are to light even. And so manipulating temperature is really important as well. Um, the human body sleeps much better in a colder environment. And scientists have actually discovered that the perfect sleeping temperature is 18 degrees Celsius, which, yep, is really cold, isn't it? Um, and even for me as a Kiwi boy from New Zealand, I would find 18 really, really cold now. Um, and so here in the tropics, you know, 20 to 22 would be appropriate but certainly not 25, 26, which the room could be 
easily uh, without air conditioning. So people will sleep better in an air conditioned, colder environment. Um, and you can actually trick biology by having a nice warm shower before bed. The skin warming effect actually increases blood flow to the skin. And then when you get out of the shower, of course, into the cold air, you keep venting heat through your skin. You evaporate heat into the air and that actually drops your temperature by about half a degree. And that's like a, it's like a, bi a biological um, switch um, that signals or triggers um, that it's, it's time for sleep. And uh, I guess perhaps it's a, it's a primal reaction. Um, caveman, when the sun went down, he would feel a little cold and that would be a, a prompt to go and lie down by the fire and go to sleep. Really easy trick um, proven by science. Interesting study uh, a year or two, or two ago found that a 10 minute hot shower before bed um, significantly uh, improves sleepiness uh, and time to fall asleep. So um, as a coach, where to next? Um, I would love you to, um, to just have a conversation uh, with your athletes. Um, you know, uh, most coaches I know are good talkers, um, but you don't want to be a teller, right? So, so don't tell your athletes what to do. Talk to them, work with them, don't work on them. Working on people doesn't work. Um, but, you know, if you work with people, if you have an intelligent conversation about, about their sleep issues and then about some solutions, maybe some solutions you heard um, uh, in this presentation and some more solutions that you'll hear uh, in the next one, I think that will really help your athletes sleep a whole lot more. Um, questions like when do they sleep? When do they wake up? How much total sleep are they getting? Um, are they getting seven? Are they getting eight? Are they getting nine or more? Are they getting less than six? What impact is that having on their REM sleep, on their light sleep, both of which, you know, we get most of it in the last two hours of, a, of an eight hour night? Um, are they needing to go back to bed before midday? And if so, are they sleep deprived? Are they not getting enough sleep quality? Is your coaching program compromised uh, by that? So these are all really good, intelligent questions to ask and, um, and just have a, a conversation, really, a solution-based generative conversation with your athletes. And just simply having athletes monitor themselves. Um, and, you know, like science is, is still trying to work out how to best monitor an athlete. And there's so many gadgets and widgets and toys and software and hardware and wearables and all these things. Um, but actually, the, the thing that works the best is just asking an athlete, how do you feel? Um, are, you, are you ready to train today? Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how was your sleep quality last night? How many total hours sleep did you get? doesn't need to be more complicated than that, actually. So there you are, there's, uh, there's drug ZZZ. Um, I, in, I always introduce um, or, or, or put this into a conversation around sleep. Um, I remember when I first met Joseph Schooling, he was training over at the University of Texas and his coach, Eddie Reese. Eddie's like top three swim coaches in the world, um, I would say. Um, you know, he's in his 70s, he's an absolute legend. And he pulls me up in front of um, in front of Joe's swim team, and you know there's about 12 Olympians in there and gold medalists, and and he goes, um, you know, Rico, can you just let all the all the boys know what you're doing with Joe because um, you know you're on pool deck here every day, and like, he's got like a funny watch on his wrist, and like the guys are just really interested and curious. And I said, well, sure, I've flown over from Singapore to put him on a on a performance enhancing drug. And, uh, you know, these Olympians and these guys were just like, they were looking at me like I'd, you know, fallen out of a tree myself and I was from another planet. Here's like a sports scientist putting an Olympian on a drug. And I was like, well, sure. I mean, I feel great about this drug because it's freely available on the market. It's perfectly safe. You can overdose on it. In fact, um, Joe's overdosing on it right now. Um, and it has wonderful side effects, including um, a faster recovery curve, improved performance, um, and you just feel incredibly happy and can't stop smiling, right? I call it drug Z or drug Z, Z, Z. And, and then it's that point that, you know, the penny drops and they get what I'm talking about. Um, but, but, you know, it is genuinely a performance enhancing drug. Um, and I think it's one that, that you and your athletes should get on. So, so that's it from me. Thanks so much. Sorry, I dropped off the, um, I have a hell of a time with my Wi-Fi sometimes, such is life. But thanks for sticking with us. Uh, finishing on time, 51 minutes. Happy to answer some questions. Um, and, um, and yeah, happy days. And, uh, and good night tonight. Thanks so much.
All right, coaches, uh, thanks for listening through the presentation. If you have any questions, now is the best time to ask. Rico, yep, just uh, yep, type in your questions in the uh, Zoom, chat, uh, Zoom chat box. Thank you. So someone sent me a message before, but now it's disappeared. Uh, I think it was a bowling question or something. Sorry, I can't see it. If you want to pop it back to me, that's cool. Mm, I don't see any bowling questions, actually. Yeah. No, it, it popped up during the presentation, but I didn't have time to read it, but now it's not there. I don't know what happened there. Okay, I also didn't see anything at my end. No. Oh, oh yeah, here it is. Okay, yeah. So uh, basically the question is, uh, okay. Oh, maybe it's just a comment. It doesn't really look like a question to me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. We. It's. It's. Um. Part of. Part of science and part of research is uh, is doing a piece of research, um. And then and then reflecting on the methodology and thinking about how you could do it differently or, or do it uh, do it better. Um, later on, yeah. So the athletes we work with um, were the, the development um, squad. We had about 28 young athletes aged between about 14 and 20, 21. Um, yeah, and that was that was done with uh, with Singapore um, bowling coaches as well. Uh, so yeah, always looking at, at, at different better ways of measurement. Thank you for that comment. All right, coaches, uh, if there are no questions, uh, we shall move on to the uh, reflection segment. So I'll be I love questions, by the way. I love questions, by the way. It makes me feel like, uh, you know, um, people were listening and, and it was a meaningful time. So, yeah, definitely uh, happy to answer questions. The great thing about sleep is it's very individual um, and no two people sleep the same and, and you know, we all have our own stories. Yeah, Norman, yeah, fire it in, Norman. That'd be awesome. All right, coaches, uh, now please uh, whip out your handphones and then use this uh, QR code, log in the Mentimeter, and answer these two questions about uh, today's uh, e-workshop. Okay, so far we have had a few responses already on the first question. So plenty of takeaways, uh, importance of quality sleep, sleeping pattern, uh, ability to train, uh, ability, as in the, um, the role that sleep plays uh, in terms of enhancing performance. Yep. Mm. Okay, better understanding of sleep application to sports training and performance importance of sleep as part of healthy lifestyle. So, uh, yep. Rico, any comments? Yeah, to the questions? Oh. I mean to the comments. Oh. You, yeah, you see the, are you able to see the comments on the screen? Yes. Yeah, yep. sorry, I was reading the questions in the chat group. Yeah, I'm with you yep. now. What, um, one takeaway. See if you can. Oh, lots of good stuff here, isn't it? Yeah, lots of takeaways for today's uh, yeah. e workshop. Sleep, sleep, cleanse, yeah, cool. All right, coaches, uh, if there are no more okay. comments to the first question, we shall move on to the second one. There's a couple of questions in the chat now. Um, I, can, I can talk to those after this reflection if you like. Mm, okay, sure. So uh, let's move on to the second question uh, for the reflection. How can you apply what you have learned to your coaching practice? These are great reflection questions, by the way. 
Thanks, Rico. Yep, so yeah. far we have uh, one couple of re respo uh, these responses. First thing, of course, very important is to encourage your athletes to sleep more. Uh, Singapore being a very, very uh, sleep deprived country, as it is right now. Yeah. Okay, uh, importance of educating your athletes on how sleep will help in the recovery and also improvement of their sports skills. Yeah. Okay, as a complement for athletic training. You're having a conversation with your athletes about their sleeping patterns. Yeah, all good learning points. Keep them coming. We have about, uh, let's give about 30 more seconds on this question. Yeah, I mean, the thing about sleep, and it's, a, it's the same with eating, it's a behavior, isn't it? Um, and so it's a very applied, practical thing. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not an academic, abstract thing. Um, every night we get an opportunity to practice it all over again. So having these sorts of um, you know conversations with your athletes and giving them fun like practical functional tools like what you're suggesting here and conversations it's really good and and just keep thinking about this um, after the presentation too think about it tonight with yourself and um, you know kind of be your own coach in this space and what you teach yourself you can obviously teach your athletes too yeah some really good stuff here now this is nice. Yeah, that's a good one here. Stop using the handphone and sleep. Yeah. yeah. Hey, does this um does this remember the reflection responses? Can we can we capture that? Because we could use yeah. some of this um, oh, yes, um, yes, in the next session. Yeah. In the next session, we can export every all, all of these comments as a PDF file and then yeah. we could send them to you if you want to. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to digest it a little bit more. Okay, sure. Yeah. We can revert, so... we can circle back on this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe uh, let's take this time to go back to the questions in the chat box. Okay, okay. first question. In checking sleep yeah. for athletes, it is better to have deep sleep or REM sleep? Uh, well, there's no better or worse. We actually need both as much as the other. Um, it's just that the, the, like the, it's just the, the order that it goes in. Um, the, the body drops into deep sleep in the first half of the night and then stacks up the REM sleep at the end of it. Um, in sleep deprivation studies, what they find is um, a significant amount of rebound sleep. Um, on the first night, it seems that deep sleep, so imagine like, you know, you've done an all-nighter and you didn't sleep at all. Uh, the next night, you'll, you'll get a lot more deep sleep to kind of catch up. But then for the next few nights, you'll keep taking more and more REM sleep. So the deep sleep, like it just kind of catches up in one night. And then for the next few, it's all about the REM sleep. Um, so, you know, what we can take from that is both are equally important and the brain just runs through an order, um, but yeah, they do different jobs. So just like today, you'll do a lot of different things. Um, you know, you don't just sit in a presentation all day, like you, you know, you eat, sleep, coach, train, um, all of these different things, um, answer emails and things. Um, it's the same at night during sleep. We do a lot of different things. Um, and so it's hard to say that one stage one, um, one part of sleep is more important than the other. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, thanks, Rico. Yeah. Yep. Second question would be, is there a plan in the sleep arrangement for sportsmen mm. in their in-season and off-season? I would think that maybe uh, this would be like uh, some kind of a sleeping plan. I mean, uh, akin, I mean, it's a, a bit analogous to like a uh, training plan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, if we look at, um, I mean, we've studied this, so I've studied this and, and other people have studied it as well. And we know that athletes generally just sleep better in the off season um, compared to the in season. In season, they, um, they don't tend to sleep as much or sleep as well. During the preseason, they don't tend to sleep as well either. Um, just because, you know, um, preseason, they get like training intensity is quite high. Um, muscles are getting damaged, nervous system is getting strained, um, there's a lot of inflammation um, and the athletes toss and turn and, and don't tend to sleep very well. And then in season, of course, there's performance pressure, there's performance anxiety, um, you know, there's um, competition schedules, there's travel, there's all of these things. Um, whereas off season, um, you know, it's, it's rest and digest time, isn't it? And typically athletes sleep a whole lot more. So it might be about letting them continue to sleep well in the off season, but then actually having this conversation with them 
early in the preseason. Um, okay, preseason time. I'm trying to get some adaptations out of you. I want you to get fitter and faster and stronger and more powerful. Um, we're going to be doing skill work. Um, you need sleep for that. Um, and we know that sleep gets worse in uh, preseason. So let's put a plan around that. Equally in season, you know, um, well, it's, uh, it, it's go time, isn't it? So, um, you know, we know that um, sleep helps protect and enhance performance. Where is sleep likely to break down? Um, do we have exams in and around or near competition time? Um, and, you know, how might we work with that a little bit better? So, um, so yeah, you can periodize sleep like you periodize carbohydrates. Um, you know, off-season, you know, you probably don't get your athletes to slam the carbohydrates quite so much as they might, you know, under a high training load. So we can we can kind of have that approach to sleep as well. Uh, it's quite a good one. Mm. All right. Uh, thanks, Rico, for your elaboration on the questions. Mm. Uh, okay. We have a new questions here. Yeah. So what is the plan to get more sleep during pre-season and in season? Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be um, the crux of the next presentation, actually. Um, and what we're talking about there is, I guess, overlaying um, sleep scheduling and sleep timing uh, and sleep um, quality strategies and sleep hygiene with, um, with the training plan and the training times. And, you know, we're, well, there's no competition at the moment, um, is there? So, you know, we're kind of in this really long, I mean, I've talked to some, some athletes are treating this as an off-season, some are kind of in pre-season now. Um, you know, I know with swimming, we're looking at some time trials early next year, so starting to build towards that. Um, and so it's a funny old time, but yeah, we'll, we'll, dive, in, we'll dive into that a little deeper um, at the next presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks, Rico. Yeah, I guess there's no more questions already. So we yeah. will now move on to the feedback.